Thanks very much for the introduction, folks. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, there were a couple of stories told, and, and Sam mentioned my love for golf, and I have to share a story with you. I was fortunate enough to go to the Masters a few times, and golf's one of my passions. And I was coming back on my most recent trip to the Masters, and I was in the Atlanta airport and uh, waiting for my connecting flight and just sitting there passing time, reading, etc. And I, I wasn't listening to the couple next to me, but I couldn't, over help, uh, couldn't help but to overhear what they were talking about. And um, it was a senior couple, and uh, they were exchanging, you know, conversation. And she said to her husband, she said, you know, there's a really interesting couple and, uh, with their children sitting a few feet away. She said, I'm, there's something about them. I'm curious about them. Would you mind going over and asking them where they're from? And the husband said, well, you know, this is a major international airport. They could be from anywhere. What's, what's your curiosity? She, she said, there's just something different about them. Would you mind? He said, well, okay, if it'll make you feel any better, I'll go do that. So he went over and approached the gentleman and said, you see my wife over there? She's very curious by nature. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, um, where are you and your family from? And the gentleman replied, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. He said, great, have a wonderful trip. Enjoy yourself. Sorry to bother you. He went back to his wife, and she said, well, come on, don't keep me in suspense. Where are they from? He said, I don't know. He couldn't speak English. <laughs> anyway, that was an enjoyable trip, and we're going to talk about uh, the need for travel insurance. I happened to have travel insurance on that trip, and I did have a bit of an incident, as it turns out. I got some food poisoning, but enough of that already. Let's talk about... Um This is what we do to go forward? No, just a little bit. Okay. So we have a disclaimer, of course. We're not going to talk about any specific situations that are in the marketplace. This is an education and information format today. So we'll be dealing mostly with, uh, with matters just to get you informed about some of the things you should and shouldn't do relative to the uh, travel side of things. Okay. Right. So... Of course, there's going to be a brief infomercial about our company. We're going to talk about some uh, travel trends. I'm going to address some common concerns and questions that come out um, from time to time, particularly with senior travelers. Um, then we're going to talk about what product may be right for you. We don't have, you know, the best product. All we're going to be talking about is what you need to look for in terms of what products are out there. We'll talk about assistance and claims because there's a lot of things going on around the world these days, of course and people need help and assistance with medical issues and other issues. So we'll talk about that and we'll close off with some, um, with some travel tips. Okay, okay, sounds good, sounds good. Nice to have an assistant. Let's go to the first slide, okay. Next one. A little bit about us, we started back in 1964, we're a family owned business, we have about 160 employees, we operate nationally across Canada. Uh, it was conceived by Herb and Georgina Robinson at their kitchen table in February of 64 and since then we've grown extensively, we have 175 employees now all across Canada with offices in the major cities across Canada. And all we do is specialize in travel insurance, nothing more, nothing less. And uh, some of our major partners you would know, uh, by way of example, BCAA is far and away our largest partner. Coast Capital, London Drugs, uh, just to mention a few. So we specialize in travel, and that's, that's all we've done. Our headquarters are here in Richmond, British Columbia, and uh, we've operated there ever since our inception. We're very involved in, uh, in Make-A-Wish. Uh, we ensure the travelers, obviously, that go on our Make-A-Wish. We've contributed over a million dollars to Make-A-Wish, so we're very, very um, community-oriented. And, of course, being a family business, the families uh, that own the business are very concerned about other families, so we're very proud of that. Let's talk a little bit about some of the travel trends that are out there. Uh, of course, with the Canadian dollar being what it is these days, it's discouraging a lot of travel to the United States. People are going to Asia and the South Pacific a lot more. Uh, certainly Europe, although there's some things going on there right now that it, uh, are undesirable for some folks, particularly in Paris, of course. And uh, the Caribbean and, Mexi Caribbean and Mexico have dropped off a little bit because there's been some uh, rather unsavory goings on down in Mexico from time to time, although I was there in the early part of the year, and I had no concerns whatsoever. So I think there's some, perhaps, misconceptions about Mexico. It represents some tremendous value, the way the peso is con compared to the Canadian dollar. Uh, here's a survey from G Adventures showing the top um, travel destinations. You'll notice that Madagascar's in there, Iran, uh, South Korea being number six, and that's South Korea, of course, not North Korea, uh, along with uh, Butuan and Montenegro. And I had the good pleasure of going to Montenegro about uh, three years ago, which was most unusual, I have to say. 
as far as travel trends are concerned, Vancouver, of course, um, is a very popular destination, as is Canada, because we're celebrating a, a big birthday, of course, coming up. And the New York Times and Best uh, and Lonely Planet have voted Vancouver and certainly Canada as the top destination. So we're going to be seeing a lot more people in our country as, as we go forward to that birthday. Uh, some more statistical stuff. We welcomed over 20 million international tourists. Uh, as far as the uh, visiting family and friends, that's going to be uh, going up as well. And we had visitations bump up in 2017, and we anticipate that to go up by 10% as we go forward. So it's a popular destination. Now let's talk about the people that um, have purchased coverage. And a lot of you out there I know have traveled extensively and do purchase coverage, and some don't, and that's your choice. But you notice that um, in 2016, about 78% of the population, almost 8 out of 10 people, have purchased coverage. That leaves about 20% not covered, and then uh, I'm not sure about that group says they're not sure. I don't know who they are, but um, they might need some psychological help. In any event, I'm concerned about the part, the 20% that are not covered, because there's some real landmines out there they have to be aware of, and we're going to talk about some of those things. 37% claim they're unaware of the risk. Well, that's, a, that's almost 4 in 10 with all the information that's in the media today and all the stories you hear. Um, it, it surprises me those numbers are that high. Uh, the 28% say it's too expensive. Well, is it really? If you break it down to a cost per day or as a percentage of your trip, is it really that much? What's the option if you don't have coverage? Okay, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we, then we have trips for one night or two nights, and then somebody apparently forgot it was too inconvenient. Well, it's pretty convenient these days. You can even purchase product online. If you're at home in your pajamas at 10 o'clock at night, you can purchase product online and be covered within a matter of minutes. Okay, next slide. So let's address some of the common questions and concerns that come up out there. There's a lot of confusion, misconception about things, and I'd like to address some of those now. Okay. So why is it important? Well, I talked about food poisoning I had when I was um, down at the Masters on the way home. Uh, it could be a dental cavity, it could be appendicitis, it could be something very minor, or it could be certainly something very major, and you really have no control over these things. Uh, so there's medications and conditions and all sorts of health issues we have to be aware of. So what if emergency happens in the United States? And we know that is far and away the most expensive place to have medical coverage. You could be looking at anywhere from ten dollars to $20,000 a day if you're hospital hospitalized in the United States. Okay? So... $12,000 a day U.S., that's after-tax money, of course, and $12,000 is what, 50000 Canadian, I guess, something like that? Um, and I want to speak to an air ambulance um, back, to, uh, back to Canada. We just dealt with a claim not too long ago, and it happened just across the border here in Point Roberts. Uh, a gentleman in his late 50s uh, went for a bicycle ride. He's a very healthy individual. He crossed over the border in Point Roberts. He had one of our coverages. And he got from about here to the end of the room, and he had a cardiac arrest and fell flat in his face on his bicycle. Now, we had to airlift that individual to uh, St. Joseph's, which is one of the best intensive care uh, cardiac wards in the United States in Bellingham. So for starters, that was $23,000 just for opening. He spent eight days, eight days there in intensive care, and the bill was $335,000. So anybody who says that uh, I'm close to the border, maybe I'll just drag myself back across the border into Canada, uh, is just not reality. That individual collapsed and fell on his face. So uh, it was $335,000 for an eight-day stay in Bellingham. Okay, so that was right close to home. Next one, please. Yeah, we paid that claim entirely. That was a fully payable claim on our part. They couldn't do that, unfortunately. Yeah, we had, it had to be taken care of in the United States. He was, we just were not able to get him across the border into Canada because of the time sensitivity. It was a very urgent and very dire situation. Okay. So, but I'm covered by the provincial health plan. Well, we are, um, but we maybe not realize just how little the coverage is. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a provincial health plan, uh, $75 a day. Well, that's a little bit less than $12,000 a day, isn't it? So who's going to make up the shortfall? Uh, $28 uh, in change paid toward doctor's fees and ER, ER visits are not covered at all. So um, I think you can do the math on this. It's a very expensive proposition if you don't have coverage, and you, I would not rely on the provincial government. If you go onto the MSP website, you'll see what they say about provincial, uh, sorry, about out-of-country medical coverage. They strongly recommend supplemental coverage both on the MSP website here in BC, and uh, I have a publication over here from the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade that speaks to the need for it as well. So both provincial and federal governments are saying you should have coverage, so I, we probably want to heed that information. 
Okay, isn't travel insurance expensive? Well, we 8% of the population figured it was expensive, but let's take a look at what the impact is here. Okay, so here's a situation here. Uh, $131,000 claim we paid. Uh, that individual had an abdominal issue, okay, in the United States. That's a, almost $132,000 that we paid out on that claim. And our provincial government was very generous. They put $722, uh, $722 towards that. So if you're not covered, where are you going to come up with the additional $131,000 to pay for that claim? It could have a significant impact, particularly in your retirement years, when travel is one of the top five uh, areas of interest in retirement, okay? Well, I'm healthy, I never get sick. Well, famous last words. Uh, it may be somebody else in your family, it may be you, but sometimes we have no control over those. It could be sickness, it could be accident, it could be injury. Okay, here's another claim, uh, situation. Over 50% of the claims that we deal with are dealing with accidents, okay? Uh, I can't help but think about a claim we had recently. Uh, this was sold uh, by a broker over in Victoria. It was a senior couple. He was 85, she was 69. They were traveling in Oregon, and uh, they were experienced foragers of mushrooms. Now, I know what you're thinking. Okay, it wasn't those kind of mushrooms. Um, they were in Oregon. They uh, talked to the local uh, party there that was very involved in foraging of mushrooms. They said there's nothing to be overly concerned here. Unfortunately, they got into a batch of mushrooms. They were very, very sick. She was ill, and he was on the verge of death. And fortunately, uh, we were able to help them. They were hospitalized, and that was billed about $60,000 was that claim that we paid in full for a bad batch of mushrooms. Okay. So that was a vacation that went uh, very, very wrong. Here's an individual, another claim that we paid, just over $20,000. I'm healthy, I never get sick. Well, this was an accident. Somebody fell off a patio while trying to hang a planter for their daughter uh, down in California. That was $20,000. Uh, here's another situation with somebody with uh, abdominal issues. This was over $50,000 that we paid. These are all actual claims that we have paid, okay? And approximately 5% of claims do not get paid for various reasons, be it pre-existing conditions, uh, it could be exclusions, or it could be a situation where somebody has, and this never happens, right? They didn't tell the truth on the medical health questionnaire. No, nobody would do that, would they? Hmm? As it turns out, about 14% of the population knowingly answers medical health questionnaires incorrectly. Knowingly. And yet, they want the insurance company to pay that claim. Now, why do you think they wanted to not tell all the truth on the questionnaire? What do you think their motivation was? They wanted to pay a lower premium, and yet they expect the insurance companies, after they've misrepresented and not told the truth, they still want us to pay the claim, right? So the lesson here is we must disclose any and all medications and conditions. It's absolutely imperative. Now, your perception of your health and the insurance company's perception of your health may be two different things. For example, when you go in to t take out a driver's license, you may tell the, uh, the clerk a story, but they can look at a driver's abstract. Insurance companies dealing with travel have no abstracts to look at, so they're, they're looking to you in good faith to tell the truth. So if you don't tell the truth, there's a downside, and that could be the potential denial of a claim, okay? Even if it's not related to the condition that you didn't disclose, all claims would be denied, okay? Next slide. Here's a situation, uh, a lot of money here for simply a broken elbow. This, this situation happened in Arizona couple of years back, almost $128,000 for a broken elbow. Okay, next one. So I already have insurance on my uh, credit card or group plan, and there's nothing wrong with those sorts of things. You just simply have to be aware of maybe what you don't know, okay? And sometimes we don't know what we don't know. For example, do I have to purchase my trip with a credit card? Uh, who do I call if there's an issue? Do I have to have a current balance on my credit card? Uh, am I going to have to pay that claim and then be reimbursed? Who do I call? Where's my certificate? Do they have multi-language capability, et cetera, et cetera? Here's another example of a situation. Let's supposing, and Peter and I had a conversation before the session started today, and we were talking about things, but Peter's just now got a new credit card he just got in the mail, and it said, um, I have $2 million of um, travel insurance if I go on a trip of 30 days or less. Sound good, Peter? Okay, but Peter says, well, that's not long enough. I don't want to go for 30 days. I want to go for 45. So I'm going to buy a top-up from my insurance provider for the additional 15 days. But unfortunately, Peter didn't read the fine print on his contract. It said, if I go on a trip of 30 days or less, Peter's, Peter's going for 45 days. 
he had an accident on day 22. He broke his leg in the uh, Heathrow Airport in London. Well, the credit card company is going to say, we said if you go on a trip of 30 days or less. How long was Peter's trip? 45. They won't be paying that claim because he went on a trip longer than 30 days. So you have to read the fine print and look at what might happen. Now, that may not be your credit card, but it could be your credit card, and there are credit cards like that. So you need to find out ahead of time just what the parameters are of that, okay? The best thing in Peter's case would have been to buy his own coverage for the entire 45 days, and there would not have been an issue, right? Okay? Next slide. Well, does it protect me in my retirement? I mentioned earlier that travel is one of the top five things that people want to do. These claims we've been looking at, if you had to pay any of those, or maybe you had to pay for that claim, say, in Point Roberts, it would be safe to say, I think you'd agree, that um, it would significantly impact your retirement, would it not? Okay? And maybe the plans you had to leave a legacy to family and friends, okay? So without that, uh, things really could be in jeopardy. So you really want to think about this twice. Okay? Next slide. There's something called subrogation, and some of you out there maybe have uh, worked for the government or other, other organizations who have um, plans after you retire. And um, they have lifetime maxims in them. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large, and some are unlimited. But if you have a plan that has $100,000 or less lifetime maxim in it, which is pretty unlikely, but if you do, um, we will not subrogate. In other words, we will not take any claims out of that piggy bank of yours. However, if you have a plan that is over $100,000 of lifetime maximum, which is usually the case with most people, and you have a large claim, then monies will be taken out of that plan. But at any one time, we have um, a guideline in our policy, for example, that we will never um, take you below $50,000. Other providers may be able to take all of the money out of your plan. It's $100,000 or less. So that's something to keep in mind. If you have a large claim, we will never let you go below $50,000 in your lifetime maximum. So that's a very significant benefit. And you really want to be aware of what your lifetime maximum is in terms of all of the things that come out of there, prescriptions, um, physio, all of those things are coming out of that piggy bank. So you want to be really aware of what your limits are. Okay? So what's the right product for you? I don't like to talk a lot about product. I'm just going to give you some ideas of uh, what might work for you. Okay? Some people just go on a trip of a lifetime. That might be one trip. So some of you may have, and certainly I'm, I'm sure you have, purchased what we call a single trip. You're going to Vegas for a week, and that's, that's your single trip. On the other hand, uh, people who travel frequently, I happen to be one of those, and I'm sure a lot of you in the audience are, I have an annual plan, which means I can go on as many trips as I want to in a 12-month period for up to 20 days in duration. Okay? So if you go over the border just to get gas or cheese or milk or anything, that's a trip. Um, if Peter goes to uh, Mexico for two weeks, that's another trip, and so on. So you can go on as many of those trips as you want to uh, in a 12-month in a period. So if you're a frequent traveler, that's the plan for you. There's a number of other products. Trip cancellation interruption is a, is a very key product. <clears throat> if you are paying for non-refundable prepaid travel arrangements, if you're going on a large cruise, for example, say you're spending ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 on a cruise, I would strongly encourage you to get trip cancellation. Again, for non-refundable prepaid travel arrangements. Anything that happens prior to departure, you lose your job, you get sick, your traveling camp, uh, companion can't travel, etc. There's a number of covered risks there. I won't go into them in all detail. But you want to get your money back because you are going to get into a situation where all your funds are going to be non-refundable at some point in time. So you want to be aware of that. Okay? Trip interruption is something that happens after you have gone to destination or you've departed. For example, you get an emergency call from your um, adult children to say that your granddaughter uh, has had a serious accident and uh, she's on life support, which could happen. That's clearly an interruption situation. and That would be a covered risk to pay for all the expenses to return you home, number one. And number two, to reimburse you for all of that unused portion of the trip that you haven't used yet. So maybe you went away for three weeks uh, you got a call in week one for this scenario I mentioned. You still have two weeks of expensive arrangements out there that you want to recover. And that's what, excuse me, that's what trip interruption is for. Okay, that's what, how that one works. Can you just back up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, baggage insurance, rental car protection, and sports coverages are all optional coverages that you can purchase uh, on their own. If you're very active, for example, we insure a lot of different risks for people who are doing some uh, extensive mountain climbing, uh, paragliding, and things of that nature. So you want to talk to your brokers about 
those types of coverages because they are high risk and a lot of providers in the marketplace today are not in a position to take those risks on where we are prepared to take them on for a surcharge. Okay. Uh, there are other plans that are, are available, package plans are available, but we have no age limit. For example, you can be 9 or 99, that's fine. Of course, the 9-year-old is going to pay a lot lower premium than the 99-year-old, obviously. Okay. Um, you can purchase it in your home province and it pays, again, over and above the provincial health plan. And one of the things you really want to bear in mind here, of course, is two things. You cannot have a terminal condition, which means you have a life expectancy of 12 months or less. You will not be able to purchase coverage. So if somebody said, well, you know, I've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I have eight months to live. I want to take my grandchildren down to Disney World. It doesn't matter. You have a terminal condition, and you cannot be issued coverage. The second part of that is if you are traveling against a doctor's orders. The doctor said, you know, for the next little while, Peter, I think maybe you should stay here at home in BC until we get this thing sorted out. But Peter figures, well, I'll just pop down to Bellingham, maybe go to Bellis Fair with my wife, we'll do some shopping and have lunch and come back. And Peter has an accident in the parking lot in Bellingham, okay? It, he is traveling against his doctor's orders. It doesn't matter how minor or how major that claim is, there will be no funds paid towards that. We have a question in the back? If my mother is visiting, is with me now in Vancouver and she's visiting from Montreal yes. and we decide to go to Bellingham for a weekend, how can she purchase travel insurance? Well, in our particular case, and I can only speak to ours, she would have to go through a, a local broker here. The local broker is not likely licensed in Quebec, so they would have to put it through our call center since we are licensed in all jurisdictions and we would process that through our broker since we are licensed to do that. So she could, she could buy it in BC, and that's not her home province. That's correct. She could, and then, as I say, our broker would call our call center, okay. and we would process it since we're licensed to do that. Or, preferably, she would have purchased it before she left Montreal. No, but if she's here for yeah, a few months, she that's has fine. No way of knowing. Okay. Yeah, that's how we do that one. Okay. Okay. So, in terms of what you need to know, it's for in situations outside your home province, obviously. Okay. And again. Uh, I talked about the terminal conditions, et cetera. And the bottom segment there I mentioned earlier in terms of top-ups. Well, you have the credit card or you have the group plan. We will top up other types of coverages. If the credit card or the group plan only, say, goes for 30 days and you want to go for 60 or 90, then we call that a top-up to another provider's coverage. Okay? Question? My, my question is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, someone may die whenever, but the doctor doesn't say you have eight months, you have right. 14 months or whatever. How, how are they covered? I mean, if they buy insurance and they don't know a terminal date, no one knows the terminal date, right. is there, are they covered? A situation like that, we rely totally on what we're presented with from the doctor or doctors. So we look at that medical file. We have four doctors that work with us. And uh, we would look at that medical file in detail. If it's not said specifically in the medical file, we would view that as not being a terminal condition. But if it specifies specifically, you or you or you have two, three, four, six, eight months to live, then that's very clear. Okay? So we base it on what we're presented with at the time of claim. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as emergency medical plans, next slide. Um, it varies from uh, provider to provider, but in this particular case, you'd be insured for $5 million per person per trip. Now, I know the single largest claim that we have ever had is $1.2 million, uh, which was in California a few years ago on a 37-year-old fellow on a motorcycle. And we recently had a claim that we just paid out of $1.2 million. It's a payable claim. And that's done now on a, on a serious medical emergency uh, in the United States. So, um, as I said earlier, only about 5% of the claims don't get paid, but we have some very, very large ones that are being paid from the very small to obviously situations like this that are very large. Hospital stay and treatment, ambulance, if you, can, if you need an ambulance, that's fine. If you can't get an ambulance quick enough but a taxi's available, that's fine. That would be a situation where you could expense the taxi and be reimbursed for that. And then private duty nursing would be in lieu of hospitalization is some of the typical coverages that you have. Okay. Obviously, if there's x-rays involved in initial consultation or tests, those are, co those are covered situations. Uh, medications may be dispensed, or you may have to have rental crutches or, or wheelchairs or whatever it might be, uh, depending on the situation. So these are all outlined in the policy wording. And you do have a 10-day free look at your policy. I know that um, 
Sam and I were talking about this earlier, people just simply don't take it seriously enough. It's an insurance contract. I don't call it a policy. It's a contract between two parties. You have a 10-day free look opportunity. You want to make sure you look at that. You want to make sure you understand what pre-existing conditions are, what exclusions are, and you must disclose any and all medications and conditions, even if it seems trivial to you or you've been on the medication for you know, 12 years and uh, you just don't think it's important. Well, it is important. So you want to make sure you disclose those things. Okay. Only if they are prescribed to treat a condition. Okay. Only if they're prescribed to treat a, a condition. But if you, for your own reasons, decide, well, I'm going to take a baby aspirin, and that's some research you did on the interweb, that's fine. Okay. But if it's in your medical file and been prescribed for a condition, it must be counted as a medication. I know you are. No, that's a, if it's not in your file and you're taking those for your own reasons, that's not considered a medication and would not have to be accounted for. Yes. That's correct. drugs, whether it's alcohol or polarity, and you have an aspirin in that bottle. Okay, I'll address those two things. Number one, yes, when a, an individual submits a claim and they want it to be reimbursed, obviously they have to have proof of loss, and they do sign a release for us to have access to medical information. And as I said earlier, we're not looking for a way to deny a claim. We get audited. We have two providers we deal with, Industrial Alliance, who you may know here in Vancouver, and Lloyd's are our two insurers. We get audited every year. Okay, so we do have to do diligence on a file. We're not looking for a way to deny a claim. We're simply going to verify, do you have pre-existing conditions? Have you told us that you're taking the right number of medications? I mean, if it's a simple situation that you fall down and break your arm, we're not going to be doing that. But if it's a complex medical situation, uh, like this situation we had in Point Roberts and so on, with these large claims, et cetera, then we typically do write for the file to verify those things. If everything is above board, if there's no pre-existing conditions involved, if there's no exclusions involved, it's a payable claim, okay? Now, as far as alcohol is concerned, there are some providers that won't allow you to have any alcohol, okay? We have it stipulated in our policy very clearly. 0.08 is the limit. It's indicated in the policy. It's in the wording. It's in black and white. Now, that said, <clears throat> if we are going to deny a claim based on alcohol, we want to make sure it's ironclad because if we get called into a court of law, we want to make sure it's tight. So we look at the ER report, the doctor's report, the medical history, all, the, all of the things, the police report, all of those things are taken into account. And if it's, if it's conclusive, that will be a denied claim. If it's not, it'll be a paid claim. Now, I'll give you an example. We had an individual in Seattle a couple of years ago. He went down with his dad to a baseball game. After the game, uh, they had a couple of beers. They were going back to their hotel. He fell down, hurt his face. We got the medical report, and it said in the triage report that he admitted to having a couple of beer. The physician attending said he was not intoxicated, this was not a cause of an accident, and he had all his faculties. That was a paid claim. But we had another situation in Vegas not long after that involving an individual who couldn't even sign his name when he was released from the ambulance. Now, do you think that claim was denied? Well, of course it was. So we look at those individually on all the information that's presented, but it has to be conclusive before we'll deny a claim or the flip side, pay a claim. Okay. Right, family, family transportation is something where um, it's deemed by the attending physician, let's say that uh, a family is involved in an accident. Uh, I give an example of a claim that happened in Oregon a few years ago. Uh, uh, a teenage girl broke her leg quite badly uh, in a field hockey match and she was quite traumatized. So it was deemed by the attending physician that she needed some moral support. So we arranged and paid for her transportation, accommodations, expenses, et cetera, to be with her daughter in Oregon during this recovery. That's how family transportation works. If you're, if you're traveling with a companion and you have to come home, say you're flowing home for an emergency benefit back here into Canada, well, what's your traveling companion going to do? Is he or she going to continue on? That's their option. They may decide they want to come back. And we will pay the uh, cost to bring the traveling companion back to the original departure point. Return of children and grandchildren. Um, that's a situation where maybe uh, grandma and grandpa have gone to Palm Springs, they've taken the grandchildren with them, and maybe the parents are gonna join them a little bit later. Um, grandma and grandpa are involved in a very serious accident, they're both hospitalized, 
Uh, the vehicle has to be returned. The children now are dependent. What are they going to do? Okay. So other, another family member or an escort will go down and bring the children back and return them home while the grandparents are recovering in a hospital. That's how that benefit works. And if they happen to have uh, baggage uh, in this particular situation and they're going to be returned home on an emergency air transportation home, and for some reason the aircraft is overloaded and they can't get their baggage on, uh, then we'll pay for the return of the excess baggage, and if, providing the airline doesn't pay for that, then we would pay for that. That's a benefit called return of uh, excess baggage. Repatriation, unfortunately, this stuff happens. A good friend of mine had to uh, go and identify his father's body in Indonesia a couple of years ago. And so we paid and made all the arrangements for him to fly to Indonesia, including his expenses, airfare, accommodations, miscellaneous expenses, and we even provided insurance for him to identify his, his father's body, and he accompanied the body back here to Canada. So that's how repatriation worked. And of course, there were obviously out-of-pocket expenses, you know, telephones, taxis, things of that nature, which he was reimbursed for. Uh, we have a situation where vehicles need to be returned. If somebody is, is badly injured and hospitalized and so on, they're flowing home. Well, here they are in uh, Yuma, Arizona, and their car is there. How are they going to get the car back? Okay, So we provide uh, funds to uh, bring that vehicle back, and heaven forbid there could be pets involved. So if this individual is flowing home, and they, you know, the animals are, uh, are part of the family, so we look after the returning of the pets as well as part of that benefit. Now, there are exclusions. We don't cover everything, quote unquote, right, which some people sometimes think uh, that we do. <clears throat> Things that are going on right now, obviously acts of uh, war and terrorism, what we're talking about there is if you voluntarily get yourselves involved in those kinds of things. But let's, for example, you were in Paris a couple of days ago and you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and maybe you got injured and so on. Well, that typically is a, is a terrorism type situation. Obviously, that's a covered risk. You would have been hospitalized. You maybe had gunshot wounds. Who knows? Or you could have been in the, um, in the Madrid um, train station when the bombs went off there a few years ago. And there's all sorts of acts going on around there. As long as you're not voluntarily participating in those, those are situations that we look after. Pregnancy is a situation you want to be aware of. The, the um, last nine weeks leading into the expectancy, uh, expected date and the, and the nine weeks after is a no-go period. So I would discourage people from traveling in that particular time. We talked about the alcohol thing. I don't think I need to repeat that. Uh, cancer, if you have uh, cancer treatment uh, in the three months leading up to, or actually from the departure date back, we will not cover anything to do with cancer in the three months back from the departure date that you're supposed to go, okay? And then if you're participating in um, these types of sports, out-of-bounds skiing, if you're, if you're doing anything that is quote-unquote illegal, out-of-bounds would be a situation. So maybe there's somebody visiting Canada, for example, they decide to go up to, to Whistler and they ski out-of-bounds and they have an issue then that is off coverage. If they're within the guidelines, that's fine, okay? And for those individuals that are going into, you know, the bugaboos and stuff like that up in Revelstoke, they can buy um, supplementary coverage to coverage the, uh, the high-risk situations that, a, say, a bugaboo skiing would be, okay? So there is coverage for that at a surcharge. When you're discharged from hospital, you get one <clears throat> follow-up visit following the initial emergency, but when you are discharged for ongoing care, that is your responsibility. Okay, uh, non-emergency treatment, if you got a little irritation here on your wrist, which is kind of a scratchy thing, that really is probably not an emergency, but uh, if you've been hit on a crosswalk or uh, something like that, clearly that's an emergency. Regular checkups, obviously, we're not on coverage for that because this is excess to other plans, right? It's for acute, sudden, and unexpected emergencies, not routine care. So if you're in Portland and you're on a wait list and you say, gee, can you have a look at, have a look at that hip while I'm here? Or maybe can I, you know, I, can, I don't have a family doctor. Can I have a, a physical while I'm here? Those sorts of things would be excluded from coverage, obviously, okay? And test and investigative consultation, if they do not relate to the emergency that they're dealing with, would be excluded. So you can't ask for additional testing. But during triage, obviously, particularly in the United States now where there's so much litigation going on, you get poked and prodded for even the most minor things down there, it seems, okay? But um, anything that's not part of the emergency would be excluded, okay? Now, we have situations here where maybe you've gone in for some tests and you haven't got the results back, or the doctor said, well, Peter, when you get back from that trip to Hawaii, first of all, Peter's not traveling against the doctor's orders, so he can travel. But when you get back, I want you to come in and have some test, tests done and so on. If, um, if those things can be shown to be directly or indirectly related to the emergency or claim that you make, they would be excluded. But if there's no issues with the tests, 
if they're all standard and so on, and there's no, um, no connection, then coverage would be in place for you there. And obviously the uh, waitlist situation, we don't deal with that because that's not an emergency. That's a situation known to you that you will be dealing with um, excuse me. <coughs> as and when your waitlist um, is scheduled. And then the subsequent claim, excuse me, for the same condition, okay, we will not cover anything like that, excuse me. Okay, this is an, an area that um, I mentioned we have to be really cognizant of is in terms of pre-existing conditions, exclusions, and, and medical questionnaires. So for example, a pre-existing condition, be it dental or medical, is a situation known to you prior to the departure on your trip. Again, it's known to you. Remember, coverage is for ex acute, sudden, and unexpected things. So you really have to be on top of what a pre-existing condition is, okay? and. A lot of carriers, and I can only speak for ourselves, uh, will cover pre-existing conditions, and, and it depends on a number of things. First of all, how old are you? And the older you get, the more stringent it becomes for stability periods for us to cover pre-existing conditions. How long is the trip going to be? Because it's proven, and our claims uh, experience show this, the older you are and the longer you go, the incidence of claim is much higher and much more expensive. Okay? And lastly, the stability of that condition. If it's only been stable for two days, that's not very good. If it's been stable for two years, that's a lot better, because Peter and I were talking about this a, a bit earlier, okay? So for example, this is just a general guideline. The people that you work with, the carriers you work with could be different, but I'm just gonna give you some examples here. If you're 59 and under, you're going on a trip of 35 days or less, we'll cover pre-existing conditions, providing there's no symptoms seven days prior to departure, other than a minor ailment. Now, a minor ailment would be um, you've got a fungal infection under your big toe. Not a nice thing, but... Um, and you've been given medication for a couple of weeks, that's fine. If you've been given meds for more than 30 days, that's not considered a minor ailment. So you've got a fungal infection, two weeks of medication, that's, that's okay. Um, on the other hand, Peter's been working out a lot lately. He's got some chest pains. He goes in five days prior to departure, and the doctor says, well, Peter, you can travel, but when you get back... I want you to go in for a series of ECG treadmill stress tests and so on. And if anything shows up there, then a, a condition or a claim related to that is likely going to be denied. Okay? But if you've had stability on those situations, then we're good to go. Now, if you're 59 and under and you want to go for more than 35 days, we have to be, quote unquote, stable. In other words, no, no con changes in your medication. That is to say, no increase, no decrease, no stoppage, and no new medications introduced. Okay, well, but I had my medication, you know, uh, reduced a couple of weeks ago. I must be getting better. Yeah, you probably are, but that's still not stable until you satisfy the number of days from that medication change. Is everybody clear on that, what we're saying here? Okay. Now, something like <clears throat> Coumadin, Warfarin, diabetic medication, those things are a little bit volatile because they're, they could be moving depending on your situation. We look at the parameters in a doctor's medical file to say, if you have not had a change in your parameters, we consider you stable for your insulin, for your Coumadins, for your Warfarins. Does that make sense to everybody, what I'm saying there? And you would know that if you're dealing with those conditions, right? Okay, is there a question there? Considered a change because the doctor hasn't changed the prescription. That is not a change. It's in our wording to say that going from generic to brand or vice versa is not an issue. Okay, and it's spelled out clearly in the wording. Did you have a Did you have a question here? Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, no. No. And as you can see, this group, the 60 to 74, the stability period required is 180 days, basically six months. So, you went on blood pressure medication two months ago. You're going on a trip next week. Uh, are you stable if you're 63? You're not, are you? Okay. And then if you're 75 and over, you've had to have 365 days of stability. Well, you need to be stable for 365 days. Again, increase, decrease, stoppage, or an introduction of a new drug. Yeah, that's right. Increase, decrease, or stoppage. Okay. 
So those are the general stability periods. They, they could vary from provider to provider, okay? So there's what stable means. No deterioration, symptoms, changes in medical treatment. So this is the part that you really have to zero in on when you're looking at that wording. Again, you have a 10-day free look opportunity from the time you purchase it. And unfortunately, brokers are a bit guilty at not being diligent enough about this to say, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, you've got to look at these things and you've got to understand them. If they're not clear, come back to me and I'll explain them to you. But unfortunately, they're a bit negligent when it comes to that. Okay, next. There are medical health questionnaires out there. I alluded to the fact that 14% um, of the population is not answering them properly or knowingly answer them incorrectly, and we know the reason for that. Uh, so, yeah, next one. So what we're really saying here in our particular group, typically it's 60 and over. Um, some, men, uh, some carriers have a, a litany of questions. Others have very, very few. But the point is you must disclose, depending on who you're dealing with, any and all of those medications and conditions because they may, and a lot of occasions, a lot of occasions they will write for the file to verify those medications. And if you're not, if you haven't fessed up and told the truth, it will be a denied claim. Okay? So be very, very aware of that. Okay? And the healthier you are, obviously, the lower the rates are. Next. Now, we are unique in the marketplace, and this is not an infomercial, but I think it's important to mention. If you do, knowing, if you do for some reason misrepresent, for example, this lady here said in her um, application she was taking two meds. We found out when we wrote that she was taking four. Okay. Uh, the total uh, amount that we paid out in this particular case was $52,000, but she's going to pay the first $15,000. Do you think that's a pretty fair soft landing? Or would you rather pay the, the, uh, the whole amount of some, uh, what, $67,000? So we're the only one in the industry that has a soft landing. If you do misrepresent, this is assuming it's a payable claim, of course. But let's assume it's a payable claim. In this case, it was. And this is an actual case where the insured had to pay the first $15,000 U.S. deductible because they did not answer the questionnaire properly. They misrepresented. So they were responsible for 15000 and we paid the remainder. And I've seen them in excess of six figures. No, we just look at the questionnaire. We, we simply look at the questionnaire, and, and if it is not answered correctly, whether it's relevant to that claim or not, the whole issue is, is the claim payable? That's the issue, okay? And uh, if they do answer it incorrectly, it doesn't matter if it relates, as long as it's payable. If it's not payable, of course, you're going to be paying for the whole shot, okay? And there are some claims that are obviously paid in their entirety. Some are partially paid, and somebody are, some are denied completely, either for pre-exes or uh, for exclusions, typically, the first two reasons. That means that those who misrepresent the truth are, in fact, subsidized by those who tell the truth. Yeah, this is not something that we advertise a lot. I mean, it's not, you know, flashing out to say, well, gee, you know, roll the dice, because I know of a situation, I'm not going to say what broker, but there was a lady who, uh, for three years in a row, she had an annual plan, she didn't disclose for the first two years. Uh, fortunately, there wasn't a claim on her part, so she saved a lot of money. But in year three, she paid the price, because she didn't disclose, there was a claim, it was $48,000. Uh, we did write for the file, we see that, that she did not disclose, we had to attach the penalty, well, if she would have paid her proper premiums for those three years, or at least in the year that this happened, it would have never amounted to $15,000, obviously. So she paid the ultimate price, right, in a case like that. Okay, next slide. Having supplemental treatment like um, acupuncture, uh, chiropractic, that sort of thing, do you have to disclaim that? Or claim, dis yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, it all depends on the on the nature of those questions. We talk about medications, and we it, it says for which you are, did you have any? Are you taking any medications for which you um, are currently receiving treatment? We need to know what those are. Okay, but typically we ask about blood pressure, high, um, high, you know, hypertension, obviously heart disease, uh, GERD, diverticulitis, all sorts of things like that. And it just depends where you fit into the questionnaire. Is that for a condition, or is that just therapeutic? Marty. Is the length of uh, your trip that you can be for snowbirds? I mean, how long can you go and be covered before you have to come back? Uh, typically, the ones that are 59 and under, it's going to be a year. And for 60 and over, it's typically um, six months. Okay? Yeah. 
I know it's 212 days now, I think, is the, is the, it's been extended to 212 days, okay? And that's on a single trip basis, right? That's one trip. We talked about it's the single trip earlier, not the multi-trip, okay? Let's take a look at trip cancellation interruption. I talked about this earlier in terms of anything that happens prior to departure, non-refundable prepaid travel arrangements, you have to decide how much that's worth to you. If you've got a big cruise on the line, it could be a lot of, a lot of money, okay? And um, it, again, it's for non-refundables, and it starts um, at 11.59 the night before, because you could be coming down from Kelowna, for example, to catch a, a flight here two days later, so that's when the coverage goes into effect, okay? Trip interruption is for, like I alluded to earlier, um, you know, your, your granddaughter has a serious accident here while you're in Palm Springs, and that's where trip interruption would come in, okay? So it covers your return home early from a vacation. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay for that. And by the way, this is a reimbursement benefit. You don't phone us up and get us to do all that. It's a reimbursement benefit. So you pay to come back, and then you submit all the proof of loss, and we reimburse you for that, okay? Whereas medical expenses, and I think we should just cover this very quickly, Small medical expenses are typically reimbursement, but if you're hospitalized in ER, we do our best to set up what we call direct billings. Obviously, that situation in Bellingham with a big claim, I just mentioned the fell on the bicycle, uh, that was a direct billing situation. But um, if you're in Las Vegas and you go in the pool and get an ear infection and go have consultation for $200 and drops for $50, that's not going to be a direct pay situation. Okay, that will be reimbursement. Okay, next slide. Okay, natural disaster hits your residence. Next slide. Okay. Um, what you need to know about some of the things that are not covered in trip interruption as well, you may know of a situation, for example, there may be a relative that's in palliative care. That clearly is a situation that is known to you, okay, uh, and that would not be a covered risk. Again, like medical coverage, it's for acute, sudden, and unexpected situations, and that's the key here, okay? Now, typically when people book a trip, they buy their coverage at the time. So let's say you're at the travel agent today or online, you book a trip today. Typically that's when people buy their coverage, okay? Now, if for some reason you forgot about it and a week passes, well, you can still buy trip cancellation coverage. However, when you buy it one week later, you then have a waiting period on the medical side of it for 72 hours. So we will not cover any medical issues for 72 hours from that point on. If you're in an accident or an injury situation, clearly that's the case. What we're trying to do here is avoid people fudging. Well, I'm not feeling very good. Maybe I'll go down to ABC Brokerages and buy some of that trip can coverage so I can cancel that. Or I had a fight with my girlfriend, so we're not going to be going down to Vegas together after all, so I better go down and buy some trip cancellation. By the way, that's not a covered risk, a fight with your girlfriend, okay? All right. And um, you do have to have proof of loss. I mentioned earlier, there has to be validity, say, from a doctor, for example, due to sickness or injury. We need validation of that. You just simply can't write in and say, well, I have a claim, and there it is. You need to pay me. It has to show proof of loss. And you have up, you have up to one year to submit your claim, by the way. Okay? Okay. Pre-existing conditions come into play here 60 days before the date uh, you booked your trip or bought insurance. We talk about pre-exes. It applies here as well. You don't leave enough time to comply with the, um, the amount of time needed to connect an airline. So you allow 10 minutes when you should be allowing, you know, maybe four hours. So it's not, we don't make up the guidelines. It's what the airlines say in their particular guidelines that we, that we look at, okay? Uh, traveling to visiting an ailing family member obviously is not a covered situation. And uh, you changed your mind. No, that's, that's not a covered risk as well, okay? We're just about finished. I just want to give you a little bit of insight in terms of understanding uh, assistance and claims and how that operates, okay? We have a lot of numbers you can call from all over the world. We're available 24-7, as any good provider should be. You could be in India right now, which is a lot different time than it is right here. So we have the capability to, um, <clears throat> to deal with you from anywhere around the world, okay, and those numbers that are provided. And it's 24-7. We, uh, we have 24 languages in our office. It's really quite, it's like a United Nations melting pot there. And if we don't have that language, we'll get it immediately. So we have to be available every day of the week, you know, every hour around the clock, okay? So we locate a medical facility. Maybe you're nauseous, you, you're, you're suffering heat, heat stroke or heat exhaustion in Palm Springs, and you don't know where to go. Well, you call our help, help center. We will tell you where, well, maybe not tell you where to go, but we'll, um, we'll certainly direct you to a medical center where you can get that help. Okay, that's what we're there for. And people just don't realize all the things we can do with and for them. They just have to pick up the phone. We monitor that medical care. We approve those procedures with our four doctors. We keep the families informed and we dialogue with them all the time to let them know what's going on uh, because emergencies are happening all over the world and some are serious and, and some are not so serious. Okay. 
we help with visa stuff. Uh, we suggest you um, work with us in, in terms of the consulate. And if there are situations from time to time where you get into some squeaky legal stuff, and people have been you know, held in countries. I know of a situation in Mexico we had to get involved in. There's a party we work with out of New York that intervenes and helps with that legal stuff that you sometimes don't think of. Okay, you could be detained for whatever reason. Okay. Um, information from the family doctor that we're going to need to adjudicate that claim is another thing. Uh, we pay all the medical providers, I mentioned, as best we can if it's a large claim, uh, of course. And I talked about the other ones. And then we subrogate with the government with credit cards, MSP, group plans. Okay, we're paying the bill basically. If, let's assume it's a covered claim. We're gonna pay the bill and then we're gonna have to go subrogate with credit cards, with employer plans and MSP to recover all that money. Now we don't get a lot from MSP as you, as you saw in some of the claims examples, okay? And we do have quite a relationship. Um, we've been around for a long time, particularly in the United States and, and, and so far in Europe and other areas, but certainly in the United States because 80% of our travelers go uh, in that particular area. So we have those relationships there, okay? So just a couple of travel tips before we wrap up. Go ahead. Uh, don't forget, you know, these things in terms of um, your medicine cabinet. Don't assume high blood pressure. It doesn't matter when you're buying a policy. I talked about that earlier. It's all about full disclosure. Visit the doctor, get those vaccinations, and, and make sure you keep that policy somewhere handy nearby if you've got to call us. Don't, don't put it in your baggage, whatever you do. Okay? Uh, find, out what, well, find out when that coverage expires. Make sure you're aware that you can call in for extensions, providing you haven't uh, made a claim or intentions of claiming they're likely to extend that. Go to the uh, travelgc.bc, uh, sorry, .ca website. There's a piece in your uh, material there that I provided. And there's also publications available here that talk about the whys and wherefores of travel. You can also get those free from the um, Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Go ahead. So my time's up, but just in summary, I just want to say make sure that you are very aware of what pre-existing condition guidelines are for you when you're taking out coverage. Make sure you're aware of all the exclusions. Read those things. You have a 10-day free look. But, and by all means, when you're dealing with medical health questionnaires, which the majority in this people in this room will be, that you disclose any and all medications and conditions regardless of how minor you think they are because the insurance companies can and do find out the information they do, do need to have to make a decision on that claim. So be very open about that, okay? So my time's up and uh, thanks for yours.